So we'll move on to uh, Dr. Helen Scharfman. She is professor in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, as well as uh, neuroscience and physiology and psychiatry departments, as well as being a member of the Neuroscience Institute. Her lab is located at the Nathan Klein Institute. Her lab uses diverse in vivo and in vitro methods to study hippocampal, enterrhinal, and brainstem function. Uh, using e electrophysiological, diverse neuroanatomical approaches, behavioral studies, various mouse models, and optogenetic uh, approaches. She has been very productive with over 165 peer-reviewed publications, extensive grant portfolio, and she's also been extremely interested in mentoring throughout her career, and we're very lucky to have her as co-PI of our T32 uh, training program. Uh, this afternoon, she'll be discussing the overlap between Alzheimer's disease and epilepsy with insights from uh, animal models. Thank you. Dr. Schaffman, if you can click on display settings. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately it's hidden. Oh. Yeah, so let me try. Okay, there I go. Now that should work. Yes, ma'am. that good? Great. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sure. And thanks for the help. And uh, many, many thanks actually to Alok. It gives me great pleasure to um, present today, but Alok. As Asak and uh, so many people have been so important for this program. I want to um, really thank Thomas for um, uh, organizing this um, great lineup of speakers, which I am greatly enjoying. And thank Dr. Fortea for an excellent uh, talk so far. Um, so as Thomas mentioned, I'm going to be discussing the overlap between Alzheimer's disease and epilepsy and particularly what the um, animal models have told us. And my first slide is um, what probably is the most important slide. Um, some of the many people who have contributed to the work at the Nathan Klein Institute in my lab and the Center for Dementia Research at the Nathan Klein Institute directed by Ralph Nixon and with many PIs, some of the ones who have been um, so helpful to me over the years are shown and some of the other folks as well. But there are many more and many thanks to everybody. So I wanna start by talking about this um, so-called overlap and exactly what we're talking about um, when we think about Alzheimer's disease and epilepsy and this phrase abnormal excitability which seems to be so commonly used. And then I'm gonna talk about how the animal models have really made significant advances. And in particular, our work showing that some of the changes in excitability occur extremely early. I only have a few minutes, but I wanna discuss the mechanisms that we think are involved in those early changes, and then switch gears in the final part of the talk and discuss implications. And Dr. Forte has set me up because one of the things that, um, is appealing is to think about using the EEG as a biomarker since it's non-invasive and it can be used quite young. But I also wanna talk about how we can think about normalizing excitability and ask the question, would it be helpful? Would it delay or even prevent Alzheimer's disease? So I'm gonna start by talking about just a few studies that have been really um, important. This one out of Michaela Gallagher's lab. What um, they did is they looked at um, MCI patients, mild cognitive impaired patients. And um, I want to just take a second and mention that throughout the talk, I will use these terms pretty much synonymously. And what um, Dr. Gallagher's group um, discussed was hyperactivity, meaning excessive activity on the MRI. And what they found was in the dentate gyrus and CA3, 
um, increased activity in the amnestic patients. And um, then they tried an anti-seizure medication and they found that the hyperactivity could be reduced and this appeared to increase or improve the cognitive ability. And that is actually moving forward to a uh, preclinical and then um, I think a clinical trial. So what exactly do we know about hyperexcitability in Alzheimer's disease? Well, we know seizures occur and um, we hear about that, but a lot of people think that that's primarily in familial AD and in sporadic AD, it may not be true, but it's actually um, common to see seizures even in aged individuals. Epilepsy uh, ramps up with age. And one of the things that needs to be considered is that seizures can easily be overlooked in the aging or AD community because they're not necessarily associated with convulsions or abnormal behaviors. And they often occur in sleep. So you might not know there was a seizure and they may not occur every day or even every week. And so there's a lot of um, reasons to be cautious about concluding that there's no seizure. Now I wanna segue quickly to the mouse models because this really was um, eye-opening. And what happened um, um, pretty much about 15 years ago is it was possible to use high resolution EEG in mice. And that led to one of the first studies by the Mookie lab together with Jeff Nobles, who was one of the groundbreaking people in mouse EEG studies in epilepsy. And together they showed that you could record seizures in a very common model. This is the J20 mouse. It's a so-called APP model or a HAPP model. And before I go further, I just want to explain what that means. What this means by and large is that there's mutations in the precursor to amyloid beta. Usually it's a simulation of a mutation found in a family with Alzheimer's disease. And what this does is it creates an increase in A beta production over the lifespan. So many people have used those, but I have to tell you that when you look at tau overexpression, presenilin one mutation, models of Downs, as we just heard by Juan, uh, Parkinson's, APOE4, these all either have outright seizures or there's a very high risk of seizure in these mice. So now I wanna talk a little bit about how we got into this and we wanted to look early and one, we wondered if that would be a time when we could get insight. And so we chose the CG2576 model. And um, this is a model where a, there's a Swedish and Indiana mutation. And we chose it because, at least for the mice, it's a relatively slow to progress to plaque. So that allows us a chance to look early and then often and watch what happens to excitability as progression occurs. And in particular, this uh, mouse model doesn't really have a beta plaque until after six months. So I want to um, introduce you to uh, Team Alzheimer's Disease, Corey Tam and Annie Duffy. And what we decided to do was EEG starting basically as soon as you could do surgery. So we implanted animals at four weeks of age. And then we did EEG recordings 24 hours a day every month for one 24-hour period. And we tried to do that as long as we could. And the idea was um, initially, you know, we wouldn't see anything because the animals were too young, but we get a baseline. And this is our neurosurgeon, John LaFrancois, and one of our little mice showing where we implanted uh, recording electrodes, ground and reference. And then this is what we saw really surprisingly after the first animals recovered from surgery at just five weeks of age. This is a huge spike in the EEG that's basically synchronized across all leads. And it's um, called an interictal spike in epilepsy. In fact, 
we did see seizures, but early on we didn't see too many. So we saw a lot of these interictal spikes. Now, just a word about terminology. These spikes are very fast transients. They aren't seizures. The seizures are called ictal events. And at least in temporal lobe epilepsy, those are 20 seconds or longer. And there are many, many spikes and they're quite complex in their rhythmicity. That's actually distinct from the disease epilepsy. So a seizure is not epilepsy. Epilepsy is recurrent spontaneous seizures. And importantly, our mice showed all of these, but as I said, the seizures occurred somewhat later. Now, what do we know about these interictal spikes? Well, we've known actually for decades that when in the EEG there's one of these spikes, underlying cortical primal cells have very brief but profound bursts. So they're beautiful indices of brief periods of hyperexcitability. Now, regarding the effect of having spikes, that's actually been studied too. And it appears that just having the spikes can impair cognition. So let me tell you how this was studied. Um, rats were treated, so ultimately they would have epilepsy, but then they actually were studied for behavior before the seizures developed. But the interictal spikes already occurred. So that allowed them to test cognition. And what they found was when there were interictal spikes, animals had worse retrieval. They didn't actually interfere with encoding, which is interesting, but they definitely had impaired retrieval. Now, this is one of the seizures that we see a little bit later in life in the TG2576 mice. You see it's very long, it's very complex. It's followed by a period of EEG suppression. And this is when the mice, just like humans, can have lethargy and confusion, which is very interesting because it bears, uh, it, it sort of resembles what, at least in my mind, I hear about, which is a patient has a bad day and they seem slow and confused. And I wonder to myself, did they have a seizure? And they're in the middle of this period. And then the patient might have a good day the next day. Maybe that's because there was no seizure. But in terms of what we might think about broadly, not just familial ID, but we talk about sporadic as well. I'm not so sure the seizures are robust across this very diverse population, but it seems from the literature and our work that the spikes might be. So it might be that we can think about the overlap, as I've just mentioned, but also differentiate these two um, types of disorders, each one of which is of course very diverse, as one having more of a dominance of seizures and one being more dominant in terms of um, hyperexcitability. So more about our mice. Well, those interictal spikes increased with age, right around two or three months, we could see some seizures. And the seizures and the spikes um, vary throughout the lifetime. Um, sometimes the spikes, particularly in this animal in blue, um, go down. And I think that's because a severe seizure can be followed by a depression in the spikes. Another important aspect of this was that the spikes occurred primarily in sleep. And um, here you see the EEG with beautiful theta oscillations. Uh, the animal was sleeping. And this is um, basically an indicator the animal's in REM sleep, quantified here below. Although there's some that occur in non-REM sleep, by and large, REM is where most of them are found. And as they age, they can get more spikes even in the awake state, but it's relatively rare. And this is how Corey studied it. He put a little LED on the back of the mouse. And then with a motion detector, you can see there's no movement here. Here the animal started to move, got up. It was sleeping here. This is the EEG showing some spikes there and there. And the spectrogram showing the distinct band in the theta range during REM which can be um, looked at in a number of ways by different ways of thinking about of, uh, analyzing EEG. 
And here you can see if we use that kind of uh, method, uh, indeed the spikes were occurring in REM. Now, at least at early ages, when we look at different um, parts of sleep, we don't think sleep is abnormal, but sleep does become abnormal. And Ricardo, I think we'll talk about that more. And then there's probably a complex interaction. I know you might be wondering, well, this is all well and good, but how many mice show this? So Steve Ginsburg and Paul Matthews were very helpful in providing us with APP London mice. Um, and then the PS65 Down syndrome mice, which you've heard of, um, you've heard a lot about Down syndrome already. And all of these animals, also show very early spikes. In Dallas mice, primarily in hippocampus, the um, APB London mice in all of the electrodes. And we've never seen the wild type mice have the spikes. So this is an interim summary. What this made us think about was that all the things happening early, such as increased levels of APP, its metabolites, all of America data, could contribute to this hyperexcitability in sleep. And then as that became more frequent, more hyperexcitability occurred. That could have two effects, impair cognition directly and indirectly, because increased excitability allows more um, A beta to be released from neurons. Um, and in my mind, this might fast forward flash deposition. So now let's talk about the mechanisms that might underlie this, these spikes. And we were clued into potential cholinergic mechanisms early on. And this was appealing for many reasons, one of which is the long history of understanding of the cholinergic role in um, Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things we noticed and quantified here is that the PG mice had higher theta power, which is associated with astrocholine. And during the onset of REM, this histogram shows a big ramp up in spikes, which is significant because that's when ACH surges. And we did a few more things. I can't show them all of you, uh, all, all to you, but one of them I wanna show you here, we, we actually sacrificed mice after sleeping. And we went in to look at the medial septum and we found with an activity marker called CFOS, that there was more activity in the uh, medial septal neurons, which is quantified over here. So that's a very interesting result, suggesting there might be something about the cholinergic system that's awry. But why would they be more active? This, in this disease, of course, the cholinergic system is supposed to decay. So in thinking about this, we wondered whether early in life there's these pockets of hyperexcitability, maybe even in the cholinergic neurons. That then leads to their later demise prematurely because there's been this um, metabolic load on these hyperactive neurons early in life. And now if that hypothesis were true, well, one of the things you might expect is if you had a cholinergic blocker, would you block the spiking? And so we tried atropine, a muscarinic antagonist, many people are aware of. In this um, example, you see that in the same mice that was first given saline and then given atropine, atropine decreased the spikes in this histogram. The individual spikes are shown here, very small in black. And this is quantified over here, and this was a significant result. So now I want to quickly move on to talk about this interesting, uh, the interesting implications for Alzheimer's disease. I already mentioned whether abnormal excitability could be a biomarker. And I want to talk about now something else that Steve Ginsburg mentioned to me, which is an interesting literature about choline, the precursor to acetylcholine, which is a critical nutrient and has been shown for, for decades that if it's given to mothers uh, before birth, the offspring have improved cognition. And this is actually in normal rocks. So um, people have started to really look at this and uh, it's starting to be looked at in Down syndrome, which is very exciting. And I want to introduce you now to Team Colleen. 
And what we decided to do was study it in the GT2576 mice. So we looked at three diets. The one that we had been using for a long time, which is an intermediate choline level, one with higher choline, and one with lower choline. And this is the timeline of these studies where we give the diet throughout uh, mating, gestation, and until weaning. And then we implant the animals for monthly EEG. We also do periodic behavior at three months and six months. And this is just some of the data using the novel object location task. And this is just three months of age. Um, first of all, with the diet we'd always used, you can see the wild type can perform the task, but the transgenics cannot. So there's the deficit. In the choline enriched animals, everybody improved. And now this is really interesting. In the low choline group, there were deficits even in the wild type mice. So here at six months, the choline enriched groups continue to have effects. So that's very promising. We also sacked the animals at six months to look at different um, anatomical Stains, one of which is delta FOS in the granule cells of the dentate gyrus. Now, delta FOS is interesting because it's an activity marker, <clears throat> but it um, is able to detect increased activity over the last week or two. It's not just a short term marker. <clears throat> so, in that way, it's different from CFOS. If you look at the original diet, you see some black neurons. Those are the very active ones. With choline enrichment, you can see, I think, that that's not as prominent. And with the low choline diet, it's a very large number of cells that are active. And we actually saw seizures in these mice. So low choline does not look like a very good diet. Choline looks very promising and results are quantified here. So they were significant in anterior hippocampus. Now, what about those spikes? Well, when we looked at the diet, the mice um, that had um, the high choline diet, they had reduced number of spikes shown here in red. And this is up to four months. And now we're doing more times. Um, but what was really surprising was the low choline animals had even fewer spikes. And this, I think, is due to the fact that they were having intermittent seizures, which, as I mentioned earlier, can depress spike rates transiently. But in general, the low choline animals were really um, uh, not um, promising. Uh, they had high mortality, which I don't have time to show you. So high choline looks like a very promising approach with spikes reduced, normalized excitability, improved behavior, and low mortality. And now what I want to try to do is summarize for you. We discussed um, just briefly in a very large field, some of the things that people are talking about when they think about Alzheimer's disease and epilepsy. And I've um, thrown out to you our working hypothesis that maybe in aging AD, most people will have hyperexcitability, which might benefit a lot from treatment, but Epilepsy is where the headline is seizures. And maybe that's going to help us moving forward. Now, um, in terms of the mouse models, um, they have been, I think, incredibly helpful in telling us the diversity of mechanisms where increased excitability occurs, both in familial and in the other types of models. And our work suggests that this can occur quite early in life. So in terms of uh, implications, again, we think, well, we might consider in some cases anti-seizure drugs. And in fact, these are um, um, ongoing in preclinical and clinical trials. Our work with uh, prenatal and early postnatal choline suggests that increasing choline is useful. And low choline is really very, um, very negative. And it, uh, with that, I wonder if this is one of the reasons in developing countries with a poor diet, um, that there may be an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. 
I think that's very important to think about. But I'll leave you with one thought, which is whether prenatal choline could be our next folic acid. And with that, I just want to thank you for your attention and again, the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for a, a wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Sharfman. So we, we're open for uh, a, a question or two. I think Moses Chow has a question. Um, can you speak? Yes, hi, Helen, that was very nice. Uh, Moses. You no, know, ALS patients have hyperexcitability. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could draw any conclusions from that because a lot of disorders show this. <laughs> But yeah, you've shown yeah, that yeah. there's a cause and effect. So I'm, I'm curious if that extends to other disorders, even autism. Yes, I was going to mention autism. And in fact, in autism, you see those interictal spikes. And it's a little bit contentious whether those are impairing cognition in autism. Although there is data that I showed you that they're impairing cognition in, in the rats and some other instances. I think what we're looking at is one of the most common problems in, um, in neurological disorders, and I'm just going to speak very broadly, in, in, neuro, in neurology and in psychiatry, I think neurons uh, often have a dysregulation of the many types of ways they need to be in a, in a balance of excitation and inhibition. So mechanisms the good news is there are many mechanisms to study to potentially help correct the imbalance. But in each disorder, the imbalance may be due to different reasons. So, um, you know, in, again, we'll just talk about autism. Uh, Richard Penn has, and his laboratory has some elegant data about what is causing the imbalance. In epilepsy, there are actually diverse reasons. So there are diverse targets for new drugs that people are testing based on that. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, I suspect there are diverse mechanisms as well. Um, but I think that if we um, are, keep ourselves open to the fact that hyperexcitability may be common and not just in epilepsy, we'll be open to more possibilities for therapeutics. And to me, that's very, very exciting. Thank you. Uh, so uh, th thank you for a very provocative talk. And I, I think uh, th th there'll certainly be a time for more questions at the end of uh, the, the talks this afternoon. Uh, we can go on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Ricardo Osorio.